Hello, everyone. It's Dr. Andrew Heyman. Uh, nice to be back with you. Sorry, I'm just making some adjustments here. Maybe that's a little bit better. Okay, great. So, uh, wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, once again, um, this is another lecture in the series for our South African conference. And to continue with the theme of immune related issues, I wanted to go to kind of a systems level and talk about the relationship between stress, meaning HPA axis activation and cortisol production, and its interrelationship with the immune brain connection. I think it's a really important um, topic and one that I, I think will not only expand your knowledge of uh, the stress response and lend some depth to the evidence underneath of it, but also open up some new treatment options for you that you might not have considered before. I would also say that it should hopefully uh, dispel this notion of adrenal fatigue. And if it's a term that you're using or it's a concept that you sort of have bought into, I would say, you know, let, you know, walk, walk with me through this lecture. Let's look at the evidence uh, for HPA axis dysregulation, and let's compare that to the idea of adrenal fatigue. This is really where the evidence lies, and I think it'll become clear over time uh, why I say that. I also think that, you know, by applying the concept of adrenal fatigue, sometimes it can point us in the wrong direction with respect to what's going on with our patients and, and how to deal with them. This also interfaces with some of the other lectures related to uh, uh, biotoxin illness um, and the way in which we sort of have this invocation of a systems biology based expression of SIRS uh, with respect to SIRS influences the HPA axis, SIRS influences the gut immune brain connection. Uh, and so we see features of, of, you know, imbalances within these physiologic uh, subdomains. Uh, as a component of this broader notion of a biotoxin-based uh, process. So what, what are my objectives? We're, we're going to uh, review first the physiologic stress response. Uh, in addition to that, I'll discuss the impact of cortisol on the nervous and the immune system. Uh, we'll describe common illnesses that are associated with hypocortisol states that mediate disease progression and prognosis. And then we'll review some treatment strategies and discuss a clinical case. And, uh, you know, this is sort of where my thought has gone in terms of, uh, you know, being a practitioner for now 30 years uh, in the anti-aging and, and integrative medicine uh, world. And it, for me, it, it's well described by uh, a very famous neuroscientist. His name is Fouad Lachine. And he had done some incredible work in the 80s and 90s looking at the interrelationship of the central nervous system as it coordinates with other systems in the body and how intricately tied all of these subsystems are, uh, regardless of almost the disease category. And so, you know, he had come to this recognition that, yeah, the body is a system of systems and that we need to sort of look at all of these patterns that begin to express and emerge as humans devolve into illness and what those patterns mean. So this is what he writes in the opening to one of his books. Now, you know, Dr. Lachine was nominated for the Nobel Prize because of this work in the early 2000s. And, and I can understand uh, what, why that is, because, uh, you know, he, he's such an important voice in the field. So he writes, a human being is much more than the sum of blood, bone and viscera. In the same way, each fragment of truth in itself is a lie. Therefore, the accumulation of unintegrated scientific facts does not protect us against ignorance. In the measure that we interrelate a greater number of fragments, the closer we can come to truth, although truth as an absolute is unattainable. And I think he's, yeah, I think he's right. You know, this notion that, you know, we don't look at one piece of information. We always want to put it in a context. We want to drive deeper and have a, a, a you know, a, 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 a greater analysis of the uh, patterns of information that are emerging and that's where we create meaning, but that even when we embrace as, as many data points as possible and derive meaning from those data points, the attaining absolute truth is, is uh, near impossible. But that's always our goal. You know, this sense of pattern recognition, data analytics, looking at various pieces of information, putting it all together in a way that sort of better describes what's going on with our patients. Um, and I think, you know, labels matter, language matters. 
Um, and again, you know, in, in sort of the context of this discussion, I do believe that, you know, when we use the term adrenal fatigue, that takes us out of the notion of a set of interrelated facts and it locates our attention to, you know, this uh, sort of idea that stress exhausts the adrenals and therefore we have underproduction of cortisol and that's what causes problems. Well, that's not really the case. And so we're kind of laying blame at the wrong feet and we're coming to the wrong conclusion. And I think this leads to, at least at times, probably poor treatment uh, choices. Now, in addition to that, I also want to um, uh, relate to you a quote that uh, was written by a very famous uh, U.S. surgeon. His name is Richard Seltzer. He was um, a, a poet and a highly regarded um, uh, surgeon out of uh, the Harvard system. And, you know, this also gets back to my original training. So long before I became a physician, I was uh, fully immersed in traditional Chinese medicine. Most of my instructors were from Japan and China. So I have uh, long experience in traditional healing methods, acupuncture, manual therapies, botanicals, mind-body techniques, um, energetic work. So I come out of that perspective and I hold a high regard to what has come before us for thousands of years. And every culture around the world, including African cultures, have long traditions, especially in the plant um, plant world uh, and botanicals. Um, mine just happens to be a deep exposure to traditional Chinese medicine. And I felt that um, Dr. Seltzer's words really resonated with me. And I understood deeply sort of what he was observing. So this is an event that occurred many years ago, um, several decades ago, really, when the Dalai Lama traveled to the United States with his personal physician, uh, who practices a form of traditional Chinese medicine, Tibetan medicine, which is kind of a hybrid. And this notion that, um, uh, you know, it's sort of the East and West meeting at a time where the uh, personal physician was asked to do rounds in the hospital at Mass General, and he was going from room to room applying his expertise and knowledge and experience through the model of Tibetan medicine uh, to these patients that had been hospitalized for various reasons. So Dr. Seltzer sort of describing what he's seeing. And he writes, his eyes are closed as he feels for the pulse. In a moment, he has found the spot. And for the next half hour, he remains thus, suspended above the patient like some exotic gold with golden bird with folded wings, holding the pulse of the woman beneath his fingers, cradling her hand in his. All the power of the man seems to be drawn down into this one purpose. And I know that I, who have palpated a hundred thousand pulses, have not felt a single one. And so what is he describing here? You know, he's encountering a different uh, sort of model of, of human illness and health and a different set of tools that the, the uh, uh, Tibetan physician is applying in terms of sitting with the patient quietly, uh, feeling the pulse for a long period of time, hoping to derive some sort of deeper insight. 